Obama was the last presidential candidate that I was excited about on on his first term. Mm-hmm. And that was that was when I ran out of that's when I, that's when I ran out of innocence. Now I know they're all full of shit. They're all just <laughs> the same beast, you know. But th- we never get to choose between a great option and a not great option. It's always it's always eh. You know, you just kind of close your eyes and because you're not you're never gonna uh, we're never gonna elect an amazing person. You know, right. at this point, I would just I, at this point, I'd rather just vote for a bad bitch. Let's just can, let's just vote for the sexiest person. Can we, anything but what we've been doing. I think we I think we've talked about it on this pod before, but I remember a long time ago watching this pod called Examined Life. You know, have you have you seen it? Is it on the YouTube? same? It might be on YouTube now, but it's on something. Okay. And and the same woman did a she did another documentary with the uh, with Zizek. Just oh, all about uh, yeah, him. I've seen the Zizek one. Okay, so the one b- before that, she did Zizek was also in this one, but it was it was Zizek. It was um, a, it was like a bunch of philosophers, Zizek and um Cornell West and a couple other people. Anyway, I. I think I I swear we talked about this before, but anyway, he talks about they. She talks to a guy that's standing in front of a fucking store in like the expensive part of wherever you go to buy expensive shit in in, in New York, like Fifth Avenue or whatever. And it's like Kwame some, it's some Anthony like, Appiah. Mm, I don't know. If that was his name. Okay. No, that sounds like a black person. This was not a black person. The, uh, but he but but he goes. These these there's boots in the window that's like a thousand dollars and he basically goes he's talking about how there's morality to how you spend your money there's a moral there's a there's a morally right and wrong to how you spend right yeah and he was saying say you have on these thousand dollar boots and there, and there's a <clears throat> there's a child oh, off it's the Peter way Singer. Ma- ma- I think it was Peter Singer it's yeah Peter Singer yeah and he goes there's a there's a child off in the way in in relatively shallow water like nothing to you but the child is about to drown and no one else is around and you can save the child but you're going to ruin those boots mhm right and then he goes well most people most people will say well fuck the boots save save the child mhm he says okay but but you can make that same decision when you're buying the boots Right, you can say fuck those boots, and you can donate that money to something that helps children, or whatever. Right. So anyway, my point is, every time I'm about to spend a lot of money, I think about that, and it's like, uh, I mean, do I need the hundred (laughs) dollar thing, or can I? Will I? Will it do to have the ten dollar thing? You know, but that, but that also weighs against because I've also been stuck in the in the. In the poor man trap, where it's like you buy the cheap thing because that's all you can afford, but then it breaks in fucking two months, and you got to buy another one anyway. You know, so like, do you buy? You, you know, so you 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 have to weigh those things. Like, what my point is, it no, no matter how rich you are, I mean, I guess if it gets to a certain level, but I'm never going to approach any like billionaire level. I guess when you're a billionaire, maybe a thousand dollars is not a thousand dollars, but. I feel like if you make if you if you making six figures, a thousand dollars is a thousand dollars. Whether you making six figures or whether you whether you got ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, a thousand dollars still feels like a lot of money to spend. You know? Yeah, I mean, what what's your opinion? Because that's Peter Singer talking about the drowning child experiment, right? And mm-hmm. and it kind of like blew open um, college philosophy or whatever. Right where it, like utilitarianism is what we're talking about, right? Like if you can spend okay. X amount of dollars, as opposed to like deontology, where you have rules about how you're supposed to act, no matter what the outcome is, right? Well, th- I mean, well, right. I mean, I mean, because that, because because that, you know, that speaks to the to the larger question of like how what to what do you owe society, or, or what responsibility do you have? when you are a rich person if any mm-hmm. right because <clears throat> from one some from some people's perspective is well i earn this money which is not true 99 percent of the time or at least not the complete truth 
You know, people like I earned this money, so I should be able to spend it on whatever the fuck I want, right? And some very very rich people, do you know, the ones that like dodge taxes and don't need a passport. Those people, they look at it like, well, the government misspends all this money, so it's much, it, it, you know, it, it's much better off for me to dodge all these taxes and spend the money on the things I think deserve, you know, money. You know, but on the other side of that, it's like, well, society has organized itself in such a way for you to have gotten rich or remain rich. So how much do you owe society? You know, or how much do you owe the people around you? Like, um, who just did that? Um, a comedian just. Um, um, damn, his name escapes me at the moment. I feel so stupid. Um, he played Day Day. You know what I'm talking about? Next Friday. I'm gonna feel so stupid when you say it. Tommy Lister. No, no, that's Debo. That's no, Debo. no, not Tommy Lister. No, he played Day Day. Debo wasn't yeah, in next up. Friday. Mike Epps. Mike Epps. Mike Epps just bought back <clears throat> his his old neighborhood in in Indiana. He like bought up the whole hood and like fixed everything up, fixed up all the houses and all of that. Um, you know, but do you feel like? Like, does someone that comes from a poor place, do they owe it to that place to come back and invest? Should they make it big? Or is it is it strictly just a charity thing? Like, is it, you know, if you want, but you don't really have any moral obligation to, quote unquote, give back. I don't know, man, because you know? I think that the notion that there are certain circles that you owe more to by virtue of them being perhaps related to you or geographically close to you is sort of how you reconcile the Peter Singer drowning child experiment, right? Because the point of the Peter Singer drowning child experiment was like we spent $1,000 on shoes instead of malaria nets for children halfway around the world. That's an immoral act, right? But if you say, well, no, I'm... I'm doing something for myself. I have more duty to myself or I have more duty to my children or I have more duty to my neighborhood or my family than somebody living on another continent. That helps reconcile that. I don't know how convincing that is. I tend to think that's a little bit of motivated reasoning well, like the people who say, I don't pay taxes because the government wastes it. Well, that is what it boils down to, right? Is is how, because you're, I guess you're the only person you have to convince that you're living a moral life, you know what I mean? At the end of the yeah. day, but wise people know that that shit can come back and bite you at any moment. You can have some kind of—I don't know if there's a word for like a moral epiphany, but at any moment you can go, "Oh shit!" and look back. You know, it's—it's it's like the hitman that's killed forty people, and then when he gets old and like he's holding his granddaughter, he starts feeling guilty about it. You know what I mean? Right, 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 but, right, but right. like, but like that whole time he justified it. Oh, he's a rat, or you know, they went against the gang, or whatever. And then on his deathbed, he's or in his old age, he starts he starts feeling those those lives and feeling that guilt. Like that, any at any time that guilt can come back up on you. you yeah, know? I'm just imagining so, like hmm. the Sackler patriarch like dying in his bed, surrounded by his wealthy evil family and he just looks around and he goes oh shit i fucked up yeah i mean he's gonna i mean it's gonna be well before he's dying like when he when he's on when he's on those on them fucking pain meds yeah that's true you know he's gonna be an old age on those pain meds because a lot of people think they're gonna die like uh who was that old fuck that just died henry kissinger oh yeah 101 yeah you know shit. yeah he was a hundred and something but you know, that doesn't happen for most people. I mean, how do you stay that health? I mean, that's how you know the motherfucker was evil because, you know, it never caught up to him. He never felt bad. That's the only way you That's the only way you live to 100 is no guilt. You can't be a, you can't be a guilty 90-year-old and make it to 100. Like, that motherfucker, he felt good about all that evil shit he did all the way up till he fucking faded away. Well, that's why you know? people talk about, like, the difference between... Like Obama, when you look at Obama when he started in office and when he ended his time in office, and that motherfucker aged like forty years. And oh yeah, well, Trump, dude, every, he looks exactly the same. Yeah, man, every president aged like that except Trump. 
<laughs> uh, you know, and, and John F. Kennedy, but that was for different reasons. You know, he didn't really make it to the end. Yeah, but my point is, Henry Kissinger was probably on his deathbed. It was like, one, you know, any last request? And he's like, man, if I could just, if I could just destabilize one more government, <laughs> you know, if I could just initiate one coup on my way out. Um, all right. We don't normally start the show with deep uh, intellectual. And I, I mean, how deep was that really? See, see, the thing is, that's as deep as I'm willing to go. I hate talking to philosophy majors, you know, because they always, you know, it always gets. You know, I think some people don't understand that you can be educated and not be intelligent. It, does that make any sense? 100 percent. Or you can you can you because because I think the quote is always attributed to Einstein, even though I think he didn't really say it. But whoever said it, it was like if you can't communicate something simply, then you don't really understand it. You know, you get a lot of people that a lot of these college graduates that just you know regurgitate papers they wrote or fucking shit they had to read, but they don't. They don't understand it well enough to talk simply, so they start. They, you know, most of the time when I'm talking to, to, to like people that got their philosophy degrees, they always throwing around these five dollar words. You got to pause the conversation. Be like, what does that mean? Why you? Why are you talking like that? Yeah, because you don't. You don't speak this way. You know, it's like you're. You're just proud that you know this law. Why do we even have those words? Why do we have words that you know, where there there are simpler words that mean the same thing? You know. Like what is a what does vociferous mean? Define vociferous. It means somebody who talks a lot. Talkative. You could just say loud, talkative. noisy, or vehement. Okay, right, right. But why you can't just say that? You talk too fucking much. You gonna walk up, hey man, too loud. You, vociferously. You you can you can we calm down the vociferousness, please? It's like why would why why would you? Because I mean, listen, some people talk like that and and it doesn't feel forced. Sure. You know, or the great the great speakers know they know how to they know how to use a word like that in such a way that it's you know, it's the only big word that they've said in a long time and and because of the context you you catch the meaning. As opposed to people that like that like you know, pepper their whole conversation with these college these SAT words. You know, I, whenever I hear somebody talking like that, I always think you're stupid. I always think you're a fucking idiot. You know, I'm going to push back on you a little bit here, though, Brian, because I do think that you in particular are somebody who uses words that, you know, you use some five dollar words like conundrum. That's one of your favorite words. And conundrum. Yeah, I like yeah, a conundrum. When, like when you word. could easily just say problem or question or riddle or something like that for conundrum but that doesn't sound as good it doesn't have the same connotation right it doesn't have, it doesn't have the rhetorical flair but at the same time like i said that's that's a it's a sprinkle here and there yes. you know yes. it's like it's like it's like salt you know a dash a dash will do you yes because because when you because any more than that right and it feels like you're trying to make me think you're smarter than you are. Or maybe it's, it, it feels like you're insecure about your intelligence. So it's like you want to reinforce it somehow. Yeah. Like, like, I said, I, I, like I said, I think some people pull it off and some people if it doesn't feel, it feels forced. You know what I mean? It's, 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 almost, like, it's almost like how you ever, meet a, you ever meet a black person that say the N-word and it don't feel right? <laughs> It's it's like it's like yeah I guess yeah you're allowed to but you pro you shouldn't you probably shouldn't that it's that it's it's maybe I can't quite put my finger on it you know I can't quite put my finger on where the line is. There's a little bit of a desperation sometimes when people do it you know when it sounds like somebody's desperate to be perceived as intelligent. Uh, so right, I, I looked up the quote and apparently yeah like you said it's sort of misattributed to Einstein. Um, it appears that it might actually be from Richard Feynman, the physicist. Mm. But he also said the contrary, which was um, 
if I could explain it to the average person, I wouldn't have been worth the Nobel Prize. So that is the flip side of it. Sometimes there is nomenclature that's like necessary for for certain levels of right, understanding. Right. You know, well, the, well, there, there are certain ideas that are so complex that there's a limit to how simply they can be put. Yes, into words. I, I yes. get that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like the average person probably has no hope of of understanding um you know quantum physics you know real quick you can't be like catch me up real quick and actually you got a point there because that is <clears throat> that's the root of such a huge problem with the, the communication breakdown within society itself is i don't want to use the word stupid but less intelligent people d- demand they can always demand that you explain something to them that can't that you can't really explain to them because they don't understand the basics of of, of the issue. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Where where it's like their lack of understanding can, is used against you because what you said doesn't make sense to the average person. So they can always be like, you know, I don't know, I don't know what you mean. Like like explain it to me. It's, it's almost like you ever. It's almost like you ever watch a. A Christian and an atheist argue, you know, or or you argue with somebody and and you tra- and you, and you and they're using a bunch of fallacies, but they but they don't even know what a fallacy is. So you can't. So for you to even explain what fallacy they're using, you got you know they would have had to have taken a whole basic logic class, and you don't have time to explain that to them. It's, it's almost like trying to yell at somebody, you know, trying to trying to teach somebody, uh, you know, trigonometry, and they haven't learned. How to how to how to divide, mm-hmm. you know, or or multiply? Yeah, it's like uh, <clears throat> it's like s- stupid people's misunderstanding or misinterpretations of things is seen as an equal an, an equal uh, has equal weight to like a professional or an expert's understanding of things. Right. Not the ex- not that experts can't ever be wrong, you know, but. That's usually the whole point of science, which is another thing you you can't explain to people. They're like, "Well, science got this wrong, and they got that wrong." And it's like, "Well, yeah, they get things." That's what science is. It's 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 supposed to get be wrong at right. some point and get corrected. And then when we get more information, we add to the theory, and we get more information, and we add to the theory. But you know, I guess the layman's understand. We're very scientifically illiterate. That's that's a huge part <laughs> of the the division over the COVID and all that other stuff, right? Right. It's like little little words, word, little nuances is gone. Nuance is gone. Words like uh, perhaps and likely, they don't mean shit to people. Why do you, you know? think that is? I mean, do you think it's different now or do you think it's just always been this way and it's just we're living through this time and so we're aware of it now? Hmm. You know what it is? I think everyone I think everyone has people that are that that they see as smarter than them. Mm-hmm. That that they sort of allow to do the heavy lifting, the intellectual heavy lifting for them. And and some of those people don't have good intentions. So it's very easy for them to, to mislead the people that that, that, they, that follow. You, like my, my point is, you don't have to be any kind of expert. You don't have to be any kind of expert to have followers. You know what I mean? Right. It's like it's like there's somebody right now who 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 just does dances, and they have just as big an audience, if not a bigger audience, than you know Neil deGrasse Tyson. Sure. You know, and they might get a bug up their ass, you know, the conspiracy theorists, all of all of the people that don't know what they're talking about have the same influence as the people that do. And they even though they might not be aware that they're being fallacious or whatever, they they've learned all of the rhetorical tricks and all that to win over the audience. Like no one cares if you no one cares if you uh, made a fallacious argument. It's all about the moment. It's all about winning over the crowd. 
and no one ever revisits, you know? So I, I don't think, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's just that misinformation is is more powerful than information. You know, it's it's much harder to convince someone that they that they've been fooled or that they believe the wrong thing. It's way it's super hard to make people change their mind. What study wasn't there a study in the last decade where they where they learned actually that presenting someone with the correct information actually has the opposite effect of them changing their mind? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I've seen versions of that. Last time I'm looking it up right now, see if I can find the particular study. Yeah, people, people. So it's. Um, I, I just think misinformation is much more powerful, especially because because people tend to gravitate towards any idea that means they don't have to change. Um, people tend to gravitate towards any version of a story that is more entertaining, more sensational, more juicy, more dramatic. You know, it's like if the truth is boring and the lie is exciting, people will still spread the lie. Yeah, I think you know? it's also a lot of times the lies are simple and comforting rather than complex and terrifying. Right. Like if yeah. you go back to like when COVID was first happening and we were doing lockdowns and stuff, a lot of the rejection of those measures comes down to the quote unquote experts were saying like, we don't fucking know guys. <laughs> Remember like the very beginning of COVID? Like we didn't know if you had to, if you had to wipe down your groceries with alcohol wipes, we didn't know if you could pass it through like what, what vectors it could be passed through, whether it could go, live in the air conditioners for, for six months. We had no fucking clue. Right. Yeah. And so, and so what happened was the CDC put forth all these things that we kind of know work like washing hands wearing masks you know social distancing from people and then as we got more information they started to change those guidelines and people jumped on that and said like oh look see this shows like now they're changing this three months ago they said that you could wear a mask now they're saying the mask doesn't work or now they're saying the mask does work but you still have to be away from somebody by six feet and used to be 12 feet and it's like yeah, motherfucker, that's, they didn't know what, it was new. It was a novel coronavirus. It was novel. They didn't know what the fuck they were doing. Yeah, yeah, and and like I said, it's, it is very easy to, you know, and, and I think that also I think the biggest mistake that they made was having Dr. Fauci talk to the public. Not a, I, not I mean, a, I, not I, a good I, representative. I, I, I've said this before. I've said it a million times. I mean, like I said, he's he's been in that position since before I was born. Yeah. You know, and I've never known who that motherfucker was. I wouldn't have been able to tell you what he looked like or anything. Right. And and there's a reason for that. It's like scientists are not necessarily good science communicators. Right. You know, that's why you got motherfuckers like Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michio Kaku and, and the like, because they're, they're scientists that are also great speakers and communicators. And that, that, cause be, a, a great, a good speaker and a good communicator is that's a rare, that's a talent. It's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not knowledge. It's not something you can really, I guess it is something you can learn, but, but some people just got a certain thing. About them, where they 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 know how they know how to speak to people, they know how to communicate to people, they know how to make metaphors, you know. And so, Fauci has no riz, is what you're saying. Well, it well, like I said, he he talks like a scientist. Mm. So, like I said, you can't say things, you can't you can't put things in a way that can be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't use words like likely, and. you know, without breaking it down even further than that. Like, he was talking to the public like he was talking to a room full of science students. Right. You know? And <clears throat> and and that's why it was very easy to twist that shit up and, and misinterpret it and go back and say he said things that he didn't say or or re, remix shit that he said. And, you know, and so it, it, the whole thing was handled as, you know, was mishandled from the jump. Yeah. Um. But I think what's funny is if we learn anything from the AIDS epidemic <clears throat> is that <clears throat> the, 
I think I think we're we're just we're lucky that COVID wasn't as deadly, and we lucky that it wasn't a sex a sexual thing, a, se- a STD or a STI, you know, because people definitely not, like monkeypox. Well, well, right, because nothing's gonna make people stop fucking. We know this. <laughs> as 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 scary as as scary as AIDS was. Right, which is it, it, see, and in the, in the, in the, and again, the government did the same thing with AIDS that they did with monkeypox, where they they said it was a gay thing, which made people not worry about it, you know. And so, but my point is, even with AIDS out there, and people still to this day think it's just a gay thing, mm-hmm. right? But as scary as that was, it didn't stop people from fucking. Correct. He was like, "I'm a I'm a roll these dice," so, so <laughs> I I like I knew. You know, because because you know how we could have got rid of AIDS? If everybody just stopped fucking for one year. Everybody with AIDS would have died. I'm talking about when it first kicked off. Everybody with AIDS would have died off and there would have been no more AIDS. Well, everybody would have had to give up sex and drugs for a full year. And that ain't going to happen. For a full year. Mm, exactly. So I, anyway, my point is I knew that nothing was going to work. <laughs> you know, I knew that because if anything means we all have to work together and we all have to sacrifice, it's not going to happen. That's just not human nature. And it's definitely not American nature. You know, no fucking way. Because even in because this was this was all this would always piss me off. Is, you know, I knew people, you know, even in the liberal cities like Los Angeles, you know, there were people that were, you know, tweeting during the day, shaming people for you know, breaking this rule or that rule and then making exceptions for themselves. You know, they were having little secret parties and little get-togethers and little, you know, deciding for themselves what rules applied and how far they could bend them so they could get whatever interaction they needed, you know. And yeah. that, and I think that's what everybody did. It's just some people was like, fuck all of the rules. But but everyone was doing something that they weren't supposed to be doing. And there was maybe a handful of people that, like, follow all the rules. And you know what happened to those people? They lost their fucking minds. Do you know anybody <laughs> that followed all the COVID rules that's sane right now? All no. my friends that followed all the rules, they, they fucking, they hermits. Now they just yeah. in the house. Yeah. Now they like, eh, because, because, listen. COVID ain't the only disease out there, and it, and it's not gone. You know, I mean, this HSV shit is going around, and no one gives a fuck now. Oh, RSV. Oh, RSV. I'm sorry. HS HSV is that's that is a disease, right? Uh, that's just herpes. Yeah, HSV. Okay, that's herpes. Okay, everybody's yeah, but already got <laughs> that though. With, with that too, everybody's, <laughs> yeah, everybody's already got HSV. Oh yeah, well that's My the thing. My whole family See, that, got what, RSV this this uh, this holiday. The, oh, well, a lot of a lot not, of I think everyone not, like not me and my wife. I mean, I mean like my family back home. Well, it felt like it felt like everybody in America was sick. Like every single person yeah. I talked to was coughing or sneezing. No, no sneezes, but a bunch of coughing. You know, yeah. the medicine, all the medicine at the drugstore was fucking gone. <laughs> you know, and but that shit didn't stop nobody. Nope. No, nope. I mean, but who knows? What is the right way to handle it? Like, say we get another, another disease like COVID. What do What do we do? What are you gonna I don't do? I don't know, man. Because it seems to me like the biggest problem was that it became a cultural, a political, cultural football. Like another thing for us to fight over, like bathroom bills and shit like that. Rather than, so how do you get everybody on the same page of trying to? slow the explosion of a communicable disease well I, well I think a big I think a, a big mistake was make making people do it you know which mean like leaving it up to like uh like this like the government at the government level forcing people to follow the rules because that that's automatically gonna make people want to break the rules. I mean that's what that's what made it political, right? Is you know 
I mean, but could you just could you put the information out there and go, this is what we recommend and trust people to do it? No, because I mean, I don't think you could. Maybe, maybe you could, but I, I think that then you end up in a situation where one of the benefits of the government making it a rule is because then the businesses that were open could say, listen, we can't have all you people in here because there's a law against it, right? So it allowed them to, it, it created an extra enforcement mechanism for a business that if it was left up to the business, then the customers would complain, the customers would boycott the business. You see what I'm saying? Where it's like, it's like, well, you could put the rule on the business. Think, think, think about it, like think about it like this. Think about it like this. Like, I mean, this is not a one to one comparison, but I'm just throwing this out there. Like, when when we desegregated in the United States, we could have just said like, "Hey, it's up to the it's up to the individual." Because before segregation was by law, right? You had to have separate facilities for whites and blacks. Right. Then they could have just repealed those laws and said like hey you can segregate if you want or you don't have to segregate if you owned a restaurant though you would incur a huge cultural potentially even like violence based cost to your business if you desegregated of your own volition when the government says you must desegregate you must integrate then it relieves the individual business owner. No, from... no, no. You misinter you misinterpret my question. Oh, okay. I I'm saying because of, because the difference between those two scenarios is the, is the goal, right? The goal of the COVID mm, yeah. measures was to slow the spread of COVID, Correct. right? Or or stop the spread or stop it from spreading as fast. But it didn't work. Yeah, it did. You know. Did it? If if yeah. if you if I think if you look at the data, it spread just as fast in Florida as it did in California. Well, but that's a little complicated because first of all, it didn't. But also, Florida did do the lockdowns at the very initial peak of of the. So Florida did follow the CDC guidelines for the initial wave. So you know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a. Um, I'm not a medical doctor of any kind, much less an epidemiologist, so I can't like really speak on that. But I don't think it's correct that. I mean, at th at this point, aren't epidemiologists just like futurists? <laughs> you know, like, like they Thomas. all they all they always wrong. Like they like be because here this is what this is what this is what scared me is when you go look up the guidelines they gave for uh, the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. When you look up the history of that, it was the same stuff. It was social distancing and wearing masks. And it was the same reaction. Yeah, People were pissed, right? Yeah. And so you would think, and, and how long ago was that? Was that 100 years ago? It was about you 100 would think years ago. In 100 years, they would have came up with something else. It's like what do, do all these epidemiologists? Y'all went to college just to sit, just to tell me to say like I could have looked that up myself. If we were going to do the exact same thing we did a hundred years ago, that also didn't work. Because yeah, I people don't, I don't agree with you. What do you mean? Well, because it did work. Because like the the number of people who died due to COVID was not the same percentage as the number of people who died due to Spanish flu. Spanish flu was a motherfucker. And also, and also the 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 de the speedy development and rollout of the vaccine was something that we weren't capable of, nor did we succeed at doing a uh, hundred years ago for the Spanish flu. Well, facts, facts, but 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 still, the flu is still around. Yeah, the, uh, flu is like still they around. didn't they didn't get rid of it. It didn't it didn't save anyone. I mean, I mean, I guess you could make the argument that it did it did stop the hospitals from being overwhelmed, but I think everyone it was going to kill got is dead. You know, like <laughs> like I don't think I don't think you know I don't think we saved lives. I mean, like, I mean, I guess that's that's the argument that people are making that we saved lives. I don't think that's true. I mean, we we maybe we gave people some extra time a year, maybe six months, maybe, but it was only a matter of time. I mean, everyone that was going to get it and got it right. Is there anyone that still hasn't gotten COVID? 
Uh, I know there are people that claim they have it, but those right. people just wasn't getting tested. And now you can't even get tested. I mean, you can go buy. There's no test centers. You can go buy a test. Matt never got COVID. Who? Matt. Up here, I, I never got COVID. How many times did you get tested for COVID, though? Uh, at least two or three. That. So how you know you didn't? You never, how you know you never had it? I'll go. I'll, I don't know. I mean, maybe you never had. Maybe you never had symptoms. Or maybe you one of those immune those immune motherfuckers. Could be. Yeah. Well, that, but like that's, I said. But do you think? Do you think? Do you think ahead. he didn't get it because of the measures? Hell no. He was out here fucking and partying and doing all type of shit just like <laughs> everybody else. I think every everybody that was gonna get it got it. You know. So here's it, what I know. I think for, the, go ahead. I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. What do you know? I'm gonna. Here's what I know for sure. Is that. We will be fighting about this for hundreds of years. We still fight over why the Great Depression happened, what the reasons were, whether, whether the, the steps that FDR took to shorten it shortened it or elongated it or made it worse or made it better. Like, we still fight about that shit, right? And economics is not that different from epidemiology. So we will still be fighting. Like, we'll never know whether Matt ever had COVID. That, that information right. is lost to time. No, right? but you know, what? you know what? We won't be fighting about it for hundreds of years because you know what's going to happen? People are going to forget about it just like they forgot about the Spanish flu. It's going to be a <laughs> footnote. And then there's going to be some other epidemic. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to make all the same mistakes. That's what pissed me off is we made all the same mistakes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And we and we're gonna make the same mistakes again because you know, this it's the same thing happened with the damn with with the housing crisis and all of that. What did they do to prevent it from happening again? You know, remember when the economy almost collapsed? Yeah. Uh, remember the big bailout? We fucking mm-hmm. forgot all mm-hmm. after Occupy Wall Street, we forgot all about that shit. And we didn't nobody went to jail, nobody got killed. So it's business as usual. All those same companies are still around or they got bought up and they still and they doing the same shit. They're still doing subprime mortgages. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that we we know that's at the heart of it. And they just figured out how to <laughs> you know, like I, I, I don't I don't believe in our leadership, man. It's so corrupt and and, and especially since both sides of the aisle they're so willing to have these old motherfuckers that, you know, these dinosaurs representing people. You know, Mitch McConnell is, is, Mitch McConnell is literally having seizures on camera. Um, Dianne Feinstein was 90 years old when she died in office. She was literally, <laughs> like this bitch was in hospice voting in Congress. Dude, they were still lying. I don't, I don't, they were I don't, still lying about about her. Oh, no, she's fine. She's fine. She's great. She's she's doing awesome. Oh yeah, right now. She she sent she sent her aide to vote on her behalf. What? <laughs> yeah. She's dying. She was probably she probably voted after she died. For all we fucking know. So it's like, and then Joe Biden. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think I'm gonna vote for him. If if Biden is the candidate, I think I'm just gonna not. I think I'm gonna sit this one out. I'm gonna vote for one of those people. That's I don't know, man. If they ran, some uh, if 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 Joe Biden runs, no, no, no. If 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 I mean, obviously Joe Biden's gonna run, and unless he fucking dies or has like Mm, a massive, I don't know. Actually, you know what? Even if he had a massively debilitating stroke, they'd still as long as I might vote for. I might I might vote for Gavin Newsom just because I didn't know I didn't know this motherfucker was. I mean, when I seen him debate, uh. Dude from Florida, yeah, you know, I was like, damn, he he could he probably could hang with Trump in the debate on the yeah. debate tip, and he's the only Democrat I've seen in a long time that could. You know, yeah. Hillary I mean, was overmatched. Governor, yeah, he's not a, he's not a great governor, but if the goal is to beat Trump, yeah, you know, I, I, like listen, we've there's never been uh, Obama was the last presidential candidate that I was excited about. On on his first term, mm-hmm. and that was that was when I ran out of that's when I, that's when I ran out of innocence. Now I know they're all full of shit. They're all just <laughs> the same beast, you know. But 
we never get to choose between a great option and a not great option. It's always, it's always, eh. You know, you just kind of close your eyes and because you're not, you're never going to, we're never going to elect an amazing person. You know, right. at this point, I would just, I, at this point, I'd rather just vote for a bad bitch. Let's just, can, let's just vote for the sexiest person. Can we, anything but what we've been doing. Right. I'm tired of being represented by people that, 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 uh, you know, th- that, uh, <laughs> you know, that like met the Beatles and shit. You know what I mean? When they was, when they were still together, you know? <laughs> Like the people, I'm tired of voting for people that went to sock hops. <laughs> you know, people, people that prefer Ovaltine over Nestle Quick. Those people, I'm tired of voting for them. You know, I, 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 I don't, I don't relate. I would love to just see somebody up there that's just got all their faculties and, and is is quick with it. You know, like I, I just, I'm tired of the old guard. They don't. They don't have it. These niggas got shag carpets in their fucking houses and shit. <laughs> you know? So who knows? It's dire. It's really, it's really and 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 here's the thing too, is like we're we are I don't think the rest of the world really respects us like that no more. Yeah, that's you know? true. Although a lot of it's, them are dealing with their similar I mean I feel like every month there's a new election some in some other country and they're like, oh, it's, you know, Venezuela's Trump. It's Germany's Trump. It's France's Trump. Like, you know. Yeah, populists. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, populists. It's, like, it's like it's happening in waves. Yeah, I mean, has when's the, is there such thing as a left-wing populist? I mean, when's the last time we oh, had one sure. of them? Yeah, there can be a left-wing populist for sure. But can they win? Oh, uh I don't know. I don't know about that. I mean, the reality is that if you're a major party candidate, if you're a Republican or Democrat, you got a 50-50 shot, no matter how, quote unquote, unelectable you are, because the election machine whitewashes, sands off any of the edges, they whip up the base, and you got a, you got a shot. So the question is... Well, I don't know if the, it's 50. I mean, the, it's more it or less depends on who 50. you are. Like John Kerry didn't have a shot. Yeah, he did. He was he, had a shot. he was so boring. Yeah, but like they really he, like when you can't <clears throat> you can't have. I mean, that, that's the reason why. Um, what's the word? Like when they dropped the ball and didn't put Howard Dean in that thing because mm-hmm. he had that, he had energy. Yeah, you know, like the, like yeah. I mean, there was a, what I mean is there was excitement for him. Yeah, or when or, or when they didn't put Bernie in there, yeah, you know well, when they put Hillary instead of Bernie, like he because there was excitement for Hillary. There wasn't really excitement for. I mean, there was excitement for Bernie. There wasn't really excitement for Hillary. She oh, didn't I have a wave. Who were excited about Hillary. I knew people who yeah, were, like white women were. Yeah, you yeah, know that's what but I'm talking about. That's not. But they divided. White women are divided mm-hmm. between like conservatism and womanness. Yeah, you know, like some some women are conservatives first and women second, and some women are women first and conservatives second. You know, it's a good way or to whatever it. they are. Yeah, I mean that's that's really what it is. Like like you know that's why like <clears throat> the majority of like if all the women in Texas voted for their own self interest, there wouldn't be any of this weird abortion shit out here. Right, but half of them are like. Well, that's what's right, according to the Lord, you know? And so they that they Christians first, you know? Well, that's why these cultural issues bubble to the surface is because it's a way to distract people from the economic issues that we're mostly, as a country, aligned on. Mm. You have to divide people on shit like trans rights and abortion rights and gay marriage and shit like that and standing for the Pledge of Allegiance or whatever the fuck the, like flavor of the month is for Fox News and the war on Christmas and shit like that so people don't pay attention to actual yeah, like I mean, pocketbook politics the, the problem is this is what sucks about being on the left is every once in a while the left gets to sit together behind one issue 
and we get a victory and then we relax. <laughs> you know what I mean? The the right is like Mitch McConnell is like Sauron, you know? He always <laughs> Plotting why you why you think shit is peaceful because you got gay marriage or you think shit is peaceful because you got affirmative action or you think shit is peaceful because the Civil Rights Act passed and he Sauron just over there fucking plotting scheming gerrymandering you know and and the the left always relaxes they don't know they don't know how to win they don't know how to use they like they like Hannibal at the gates you know, I don't know if y'all whatever I don't want to get into Hannibal because I could talk all day about it but. <clears throat> Welcome to the episode number ninety four. <laughs> we we uh we yeah we, we we got to t- we, yeah that just that just that just turned into a thing. Don't forget if you got any questions, comments, concerns, email us at bs with brian simpson at gmail dot com or leave us a voicemail at three two three four five one one nine eight zero. Um, and let's do one article, one email before we get out of here, Rob. Um, yeah. Let's do. Uh, Damn, I was just in Vancouver. Fuck Canada, by the way. I'm so over that place. Um, this Vancouver man opened a store selling tested cocaine and heroin. Then he died of an overdose. <laughs> well, he died. Oh of yeah, that's because they shut down his. They shut down his shop. Um. So yeah. So. Uh, is it is it all drugs are legal up there now? No, no, no. What happened was this guy had this guy had opened up a shop where people could buy drugs that had been tested, um, and his and then it got shut down. And his argument was like, "You should let me run this shop because the danger is not people using; the danger is that there's other shit in these drugs that's poisoning people." And they shut down and they they arrested him for having the shop and everything. And then you fast forward like six, eight months later, and he actually died from an overdose because of unclean drugs. I mean, he he really, uh, he died sort of proving his point, I guess, uh, uh, because it shows how dangerous um, street drugs are when you don't have a uh, safe place to use. Yeah, I mean, why didn't you just open up a place where you could come get your drugs tested? I don't know, man. It's hard. It's, uh, this this shit's fucking crazy with the fentanyl. Well, they probably fucking... killed that motherfucker. Oh, maybe that's what it was, bro. You know some. You know something I found out up there while I was up there. So they, <clears throat> it hasn't gone, gone through yet, but it's it's being pushed through now. But basically, if you were born after, I want to say, basically, if you're th- if you're 13 years old right now in Canada, if this bill passes, if you're 13 years old right now, you will never be able to buy cigarettes. All right, Canadian so cigarette in, ban. That's what I'm looking up here. Yeah, in five years, only people that are, that are uh, 14 and up right now will be able to buy cigarettes when they're of age. After that, you won't. No one will be able to buy them that are, that's below a certain age. I mean, no matter how old you are. Health experts are urging the federal government to... So this is from the Globe and Mail, which I don't know how accurate this is, but we'll go... Fuck it, we ball. Uh, Health experts are urging the federal government to impose a lifetime ban on cigarette sales to anyone born after 2008, a proposal inspired by a New Zealand policy being shelved by that country's new prime minister. So so it's fifth... Yeah. Andrew Pipe, great name, uh... A clinical scientist at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute who specialized in smoking cessation said the New Zealand policy merits a close look by Health Canada and the Mental Health and Addictions Minister. So this isn't a, this isn't an actual bill. This is just this guy who's a physician who specializes in smoking cessation is telling Canada to try to uh, promulgate some sort of legislation similar to the legislation that was canceled by New Zealand. All right. What what's your thoughts okay. on the on on the smoking ban? I mean, you smoke, right? No. No. Never. No, I do. I do. I do. Um I I man, I like I mean, listen, smoking 
smoking was is is the it is the biggest regret I have of my whole life. Start starting smoking. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's um. I don't I don't know if because how are you going how are you going to enforce that that there's some people in the population that can buy cigarettes and some people that can't that's all adults how you how are you going to enforce that or will, will it also be illegal for you to give me a cigarette mm. you know well, what I'm saying I mean, like I'm kind of do that I, with like, with alcohol and cigarettes now right I mean it's right. illegal if you're under 18 so It'll just be, you know how they have those little placards that are like, if you were if you were born after this date on this year, it's just they'll never have to change those again. No, but what I, no, what I'm what I'm asking is, will it also be illegal for you to have cigarettes? Not sure. I mean, it's illegal Otherwise, for somebody under twenty one to have alcohol on their person. Yeah. But but it's gonna but be it's, weird but it's, that it's gonna be like fifty year olds aren't like fifty years from now, fifty year olds won't be able to have cigarettes. That'll be bizarre. I mean, not even that. I mean <clears throat> and I mean if if this if this guy had their way, that would make it you know, if you're fifteen now, not thirteen, if you're fifteen now, what so in four years? Because I think I think over there it's nineteen. But what I'm right? saying 19, though, can, is that but what I'm saying though is that is that if they're if they were born in 2008, so they're 15 now, right? So six years from now, let, let's assume this thing gets passed. It's not, but let's assume it does. Six years from now, they'll be 21. They still can't have a cigarette. 36 years from now, they'll be 51, and they still can't have a cigarette. That's weird. That'd be like if if you had like, I mean, I mean. It, I'm against it because I just I think that drugs should just be legal. I mean, cigarettes it'll it would probably work, but I think that heroin should be legal. I think that cocaine should be legal. I'm I'm right there with you. I I mean, uh and and you know, whenever I make a statement like that, it's always somebody that's like they have some anecdotal sob story. I lost this person or that person to this drug. It's like, yeah, that drug was illegal when you lost that person. You know what I mean? Well, that has nothing to do with whether it's illegal or not. I think what I think what it what it does concern what it does uh, in what it is in man. Well, whether you lost somebody to drugs right now has nothing to do with whether they're illegal or not because they're illegal right now. Everybody that's died of a heroin overdose died when it was illegal. So this idea that making them legal will cause more death is, is it really has no merit. I think it'll change people's perception. It'll change the way we treat it because it's if we treated it like as an addiction instead of as a criminal act, we have a lot. Uh, I think we would have a more positive response. Now that that is a very lily liberal way of looking at it because I think they have tried this. Is it Venezuela where drugs are legal? Yeah, I think it's Venezuela. There, there is a country where where every drug is legal, and I don't know if they've seen a decrease in drug usage and overdosage. But they sure the fuck ain't wasting money locking people up for it. Right. Uh, no, it's not Venezuela. Let's see. What country is it? Portugal. Portugal. In 2001, Portugal yeah. became the first European country to abolish all criminal penalties for personal drug possession. So, so they decriminalized it. They didn't legalize it, but they decriminalized it. Mm, I guess that's not the same. All right. Well, yeah. Generally, that's me. Generally, decriminalization just means you don't get punished for it. Whereas, like, legalization is you actually put in place structures to like for like the legal sale, right? Like, alcohol is legal in the United States, so you can buy it at the grocery store. Dude, this is the article we should have ran. Larry. After school Satan Club coming to Memphis Elementary School. Oh, yeah. shit, they're going to be juking with horns. A new club coming to a Memphis elementary school is causing controversy. The Satanic Temple announced that the, 
The After School Satan Club is coming to Chimney Rock Elementary School in Cordova, a school that is a part of the Memphis Shelby County School District. What? The Satanic Temple is a non-theistic religion that views Satan as a literary figure who represents a metaphorical construct of rejecting tyranny and championing the human mind and spirit. After School Satan Club does not attempt to convert children to any religious ideology. Instead, the Satanic Temple supports children to think for themselves. All After School Satan Clubs are based on activities centered around the seven fundamental tenets and emphasize a scientific, rationalist, non-superstitious worldview. A post by the Satanic Temple announcing the club's arrival at Chimney Rock Elementary School read... Oh, we don't have to read the whole thing. Um... After School Satan Club volunteers are ready to create a fun and inviting place for students to learn and make new friends. Uh, what? Who's going to let their kids go to that, though? I would let my kid go to that. Well, yeah, but you ain't in Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like aren't, you from New Orleans, right? Yeah. Well, you from Louisiana. Yeah, it's a I'm reason why you moved to California. Yeah. <laughs> this, shit, this shit ain't going to fly down there. I mean, maybe some people will. But this is where I think – I don't think this is a good approach. I see – it's funny, yeah. but I think it's going to backfire. Because, again, see, this is people trying to be provocative instead of effective. You know what I mean? I think, so, I, I think we do that a lot um, on, on – in, in, on the left when it comes to stuff like this as we try to provoke rather than be effective because like this is kind of like a I mean the satanic temple thing was like her own to the religious people that were trying to put religion in schools and stuff like that and that's that's great but calling this the after school satan club will almost guarantee that there won't be no kids in there <laughs> you know what I mean or the kids that go there are going to get ostracized at school so because no one, no one's gonna, no one gives a fuck about your explanation. You have Satan Club in the name, and that's all people gonna see, and that's all they're gonna react to. No one's gonna read your fucking statement. So, you know, you because you could do, you could accomplish all those things that you said you want to accomplish without calling it the after school Satan Club. You know, not yeah. that I disagree with kids being rational and scientifically literate and all of those things, but all you, all this is gonna serve to do is piss off religious parents and and none of the kids are going to go. So it's going to it, it it defeats the whole purpose of what you say you're trying to accomplish to me. You know, but I could be wrong. I I would love an update. When did this article come out? This is fairly recent, December 12th of 2020. Yeah, yeah. This is cuz the to me is like this is just, this is hilarious to people like myself and Rob that don't live there and aren't going to have to deal with any of it. It is a funny thing to do. But it's that. But none of that stuff you said you want to happen is going to happen, because I, I guarantee you ain't gonna be nobody kids in it. Is there a benefit though? Is there a benefit to like drawing fire away from other things? Like for instance, in Tennessee, in Louisiana, like literally one like the town, the small town that I grew up in, is like some bulkhead on the. Um, or some beachhead on the uh, like culture war against like books and libraries and shit, right? They're trying to like get all these books about like sexuality out of public libraries. And is there some value in having an after school Satan club to draw the ire and the attention of these fucking busybodies who want like sexual textbooks taken out of libraries? Let them focus on the after school Satan club instead of real shit that matters. Oh yeah, listen. I'm no. I, I don't argue against that at all. If 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 that is the goal, then yeah. it's going to work. But like, but like I said, if the intended goal is what they said, that's not going to happen. Oh right. Yeah. Like, ain't gonna be no kids attending this club. <laughs> you know. I think it's just trolling. I mean, and I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a supporter of uh, certain types of trolling and certain types of haters. No, like I said, I do not mind this as a troll. This is this is a hilarious thing to read. You know, but like I said, if the goal was to actually have a club, it ain't gonna happen. Um, wait a minute, man! I don't know which one of these I want to read. Senate staffer loses job. No, you know what? We'll do that next episode. Well, let's do this email. <clears throat> Advice champ, career change. Hey, Brian and Rob, love the podcast, and just saw you in New Westminster. 
Oh, well, I was just there. Canada at the Friday Late Show. Awesome set. Really appreciate it when you told that bitch to shut up. Can't believe you didn't say it sooner. I've been wondering about how you made your decision to make the career change from military slash corporate to comedy. What aspects about yourself did you consider? What aspects of potential careers did you consider? What factors made you decide that it was a time for a big change? <laughs> I love how you assume that I put a lot of planning into the things I do. Um, I've been wondering about how you made your... Oh, I'm sorry. I have been bartending for about a decade now. I enjoy it and the money is good, but can acknowledge it's not something I want to do forever. I worked in bars and clubs while I was in university, then found employment in the field related to my degree for a brief time. I realized I was making better money in hospitality and enjoyed it more, so went back to it. Now that I'm entering my 30s, I'm considering going back to school to make a career change, but can't decide which route to take. I feel confident in my ability to make the steps towards a new line of work, but don't want to go back to school and find again that the jobs available don't suit me for more Specifically personal reference, my academic strengths are writing and physics. I've been told I have a very analytical way of thinking. My years of bargaining have made me quite good at being personable with strangers and easily adapting to social situations. Appreciate yours and Rob's insights. Rob also curious oh, PS Rob also curious how you made the decision to get into law and what factors have influenced your career path since then. Man, I don't know, man. I didn't really I've just been kind of stumbling and bumbling through all of this. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I actually, I don't know if I ever made like a decision. Like for me, corporate America was just, was just a ride that I didn't want to be on. Like I was, I was getting sick on this ride. And as soon as it slowed down enough for me to jump off safely, I just jumped off. I didn't think about like, I didn't plan. Like I didn't, when I stopped, when I left corporate America, I did not know that I was going to be doing stand up. I left corporate America and went to school and then and then started and then I took a philosophy class that made me reconsider whether even being in college was what I wanted to be doing. And then I started doing stand up just because of something I wanted to do and I just gave it a shot and then I was like, you know, and then when I found out I could make money doing that, I was like, "Oh yeah, I want to do this." I was I was never happy in corporate America because it always felt <clears throat> I mean, I guess, look, everyone that works a nine to five feels mildly cheated a bit. Just a little teeny, teeny slight whisper in the back of your head. It's like, fuck this bullshit. You know, occasionally you got the fucking goody two shoes that loves their job. But most people that I know that work nine to five is like, they, they're not excited about it. You know, they work, they work in somewhere, they either work in somewhere, they work in for someone that they don't respect or they work in, they work in, at a place that they that that they don't believe in, or they working they working their ass off somewhere that doesn't appreciate them. Um, and so that's the that's most people. Uh, so I but I feel like I felt that more strongly. Like it, I felt like I was drowning. Like my I, I don't even know how to explain it. But I knew corporate America was not going to be good for me. Um. You know, and, and I don't know if doing if the, if comedy's been good for me. Um, I'm definitely not as healthy as I was when I was working a nine to five, when I had a regular sleep schedule, and um, all of those things. Um, and it, I was definitely very, very, and I had money. Like for the majority of the time I've been doing comedy, I didn't make a lot of money, so I wasn't eating, you know, very nutritious meals and you know stuff like that. Um. But I but I work for myself, you know, and and maybe that's to my detriment because every time I get in a situation where I feel like I got I'm working for somebody else, I don't like it. You know, it's hard for me to do acting and and fucking you know because the moment you know because because you automatically you got a boss you got several bosses, you know, you got several people that's telling you what to do. And if I, in the moment I lose any respect for one of those people, I'm I'm out. I don't want to do this. Like I don't, I don't want you in control of my time, or my life, or my money. So it's one of them situations where it's like, regardless of all the negatives that came with doing this, I needed to have control. And I don't know if that's healthy, you know. So so anyway, I guess my point is, 
<clears throat> you know, nobody could tell you what to do. You know, it, it really is something that you, I think you'll know it when you come across it, uh, what your interests are, what excites you, what, what, you, what you could do for free. If you, could, if you could find a way to make money off something that you already do right now for free. You you talker physics, start a physics channel. I don't know. Give that shit a try. Why not? Make one video. See if you like it. Make it on your phone. It don't have to be great. You don't even have to upload it. You know, but see if you can even get into that work somehow. I don't know. What do you think, Rob? Um, I think that that's good advice. I think uh, you need to make a decision about what you want your lifestyle to be. Um, he mentioned like me going to law school. You know, I don't, re- I don't regret it, but it probably wasn't the best choice I could have made at the time. And the reason why I made that choice is because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I had a lot of other people tell me that, oh, well, the training and skills you're going to develop in law school are going to dovetail with your sort of natural aptitudes in certain, in certain areas. And so I did it and I was kind of going through the motions in law school and I didn't really get the benefit out of it that I could have. And so I don't want him to do that. I don't want him to just like go back to school because he doesn't know what else to do and get a degree in something that matches his skill set, but doesn't put him on the path to whatever lifestyle is actually going to make him happy in life. So I think rather than making a list of what your skills are and what you're good at, what do you want your life to be? Because it, it could be that it's like, you know, the stuff that you like to do, maybe you can't make money doing that. And so you need to set yourself up so that you can work as little as possible to fund the rest of your time where you do the shit that you actually do like. I don't know. But you need to figure out what you what sort of lifestyle you want. And then you need to talk to people who have that lifestyle to figure out what their path is. You, you also didn't say whether you whether you were married or had kids because that changes that changes the calculus a little bit. He says he's about to turn 30. So one other thing I would say is like, I remember when I was in my 20s, I was really worried about like, I thought I was like, like I was getting older, you know, and I was running out of time. <laughs> I had so much right. fucking time. I had yeah, so, you when, so you're, when you're not even 30 yet, you got so much fucking time, dude. So like, learn about yourself, figure out what kind of lifestyle you want to have, and then talk to people who have that lifestyle and figure out what the path is for you, not necessarily mimicking their path. But the what the path is going to be for you to get that lifestyle? Yeah, dude, and move the fuck away from New Westminster. <laughs> God, what a shit town! Um, no, I'm kidding. It was it was fine. It was all right, you know. But um, it's just really expensive for what it is. It's just mm. real expensive. I, was, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, like L.A. prices. You know, t- t- L.A. prices to be cold all the time. Yeah. You know, to live by the river. <laughs> you know, to um to have like mildly seasoned food. You know? Couldn't be. All right. Um yeah. I hope that helped you. I felt like mm, maybe 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 it maybe it didn't. Um yeah, so we'll 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 uh yeah, we'll catch up on the next episode uh don't forget, if you want to support the show, go ahead and, you know, get something from one of our sponsors. Like, comment, subscribe, all of those things. We'll see y'all next time. <laughs>